So what I'd like to start with, what I'm going to do first, is I'm going to give you a piece of paper. And in that piece of paper, you're going to find an equation, a differential mathematical equation. And I'd like you to solve it. I'm going to give you 10 minutes for you to solve it. And then um, I'm going to judge your value based on your results. OK? And what's really interesting is none of you left the room. And none of you told me that I'm a total idiot, <laughs> right? And this is one of the problems. I've been put here as, I, I've been put here as someone that is meant to know what they're talking about, right? And so when I tell you to do something, you're going to trust me that I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And we're not used to challenging those that are in front of us standing. And if now, instead of saying to you, um, well, I'm going to judge your value on how you perform individually, how many of you think that you would be able to solve the differential equation if I gave it to you now? There's one hand there. <laughs> how many of you think that you might have a better chance if you work in pairs? How many of you think you might actually be able to solve it if I let the entire room work together? A lot more hands. That's crowdsourcing. And the idea is that the collective knowledge of the room is always higher than the individual knowledge of the person speaking at front. If we were to run a pub quiz now about crowdsourcing of all of you against me, you would kick me. You would kick me out of the water. You would know as a group, you would know a lot more than what I know as an individual. I may know more as an individual than each of you as individuals, but as a crowd, you have probably much more knowledge than I have as an individual. Clay Shirky calls that cognitive surplus. If we bring in together the collective knowledge that we have as individuals, we can create pieces of knowledge that are much more better, that are much deeper than those that are created by individuals. But what's the problem? We tend to trust the experts, right? And the experts usually come from departments of anatomy. I have a PhD. You know, yeah, clap. Very good. I cannot fix my roof. It means nothing when I have another kind of problem. My PhD is limited to what I do. So it means nothing beyond what I do for work. So the problem is that because this is what we tell our children, this is what we tell society, there is an expert there, and you're going to be judged on the measures that that expert decides that is valuable, and your value as a human being will be defined on that. Who wants to be a millionaire? Well, we can't all be millionaires. There's not enough money for all of us to be millionaire. So if we dream of being millionaire, most of us will fail. And then we're going to have to deal with a country of people that feel failed. So let's not dream that. Why? There's Peter Hall. It's a, it's, it's a, a friend of mine who used to teach in Summer, summer, um, Summerland High School. He told me one day, and I think it's one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. If we tell our children to thrive, to be in the top 10%, we inevitably are setting 90% of our children to fail. That, even I can do that math. By the way, I'm really bad at math. I tend to tell that to secondary school children. You can get a PhD and still not know how. I add with my fingers, because I can't add. So um, there is a writer that I really like, and his name is Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire grew up in uh, Brazil. He was born in 1921. Um, he's now become mainstream, but back then he was very revolutionary um, because what he tried to do was to understand how do you free communities that are struggling to make it? Why are there communities in every society that struggle to make it? And his answer was because we as a society tell them that they need to emulate the experts. I am the model. I'm telling children, you should thrive to be a PhD. You should thrive to be a millionaire. You should thrive to go to university. But those are, un those are unrealistic expectations. And that's not necessarily what the community needs. So what he suggested back then was, and of course, he was then jailed and exiled, right, because dictatorships. I came across him 
in Argentina when we were coming out of the dictatorship and into democracy, so it was very timely when I came across his writing. But what, what, what he suggests is that um, the privilege, the people that are coming from a position of privilege, don't really know what communities need. I, I, I constantly being told, you need to buy a house, stop renting, it's a good investment, right? But I don't want a house, I don't want an investment, I want a home. I don't care if I own the bricks. The only reason I have to buy a house is because the structure has told me that there is no reason to have good rental laws because you should want to buy a house. But a lot of us might be happy renting for the rest of our lives. So how about we ask communities, do you really want to own the house? Or would you be happy renting? And if you're happy renting, maybe we should fix the renting system. But we're not talking to communities. We, th we, we keep telling people that we need to emulate those that are telling us what to do. And then we're not ourselves, we're not authentic. And what we end up with is failed, people that feel that they have failed. And to me, this is really critical with children because um, Ken Robinson says that uh, if you haven't heard Ken Robinson on the TED Talks, go to the TED, talk, TED Talks website and listen to Ken Robinson. We, he says we do this through education. We, we, we kill the dreams of the children. I'm going to ask you, what did you want to be when you grew up? When you, what did you think a nurse? And what are you? Office worker. OK. Why did you change? Mm, just situation changed and I really didn't have a choice. Yeah, and, and, and this is a problem. Where, where are the choices? Why can't someone that wants to be a nurse, why can't they be a nurse, right? Wouldn't we, what, what do we want out of society? Why can't we be what we want to be? And, and what we need to do is to talk to people and ask them. So uh, I used to be very, very Catholic when I was growing up, and I used to get in a lot of, of, of um, arguments with my priest because he kept saying, and, and let, I'm hoping that you relate to this, you shouldn't give people fish, you should teach them how to fish. Do, do you know that? Is that the phrase? How many of you agree with it? You, you know what got me into an argument? I kept asking, but what about the boat? How are they going to fish if you don't give them a boat? And this is part of the problem. And, and how do you solve that problem? And crowdsourcing source, solves this problem because, like Paulo Freire says, in, in, in the point of encounter, there is neither ignorant people nor experts. There are people that need to come together to come to a conclusion of the world they want to create. And we used to have that. But then we, in communities, who, who remembers the neighborhood talking to the neighbors? Right? Going to the park, right? And then mommy was talking to that, oh, he's doing really mad, bad in math. Oh, my cousin knows math, he'll help you, right? What happened? We lost that. And, and we lost that ability. We started building fences around our houses and we stopped interacting with each other in a way that we can construct knowledge that it's useful to us, not knowledge that is given to us by other people. And that's what I like quite socially. And one of the things that I love is the internet, because the internet has given that back to us. We now can talk. We now can have a voice. We now have the power to say, I'm really good at this. Guess what? I'm going to go to that Wikipedia page and fix that which is wrong. And you can do that. And you have now become the expert for that one sentence in Wikipedia. And we didn't have that before. Before, we had people deciding what books to read because those were the books they published. Now, we publish. And the nice thing is we don't need to publish the book. We just need to publish a line. Someone else would write another line, and at the end, we'll have a book. So one of my favorite crowdsourcing is the one laptop a child. And so I brought, um, I, I was planning to bring more, but unfortunately, the person that has the rest of the of the computers had a baby. <laughs> and so they're changing diapers and they couldn't make it. Um, but I'll pass these around for you to play. But the One Laptop or Child is really interesting because it's a project that instead of being an educational project that comes from the top down, it's a project where communities that feel um, the want, I'm not even going to say the need, but the want to get an, to, to change the educational system, request the deployment of these computers. 
And then one laptop a child works with the local communities to provide all of the training and the hardware and help them with finding the money to pay for them and stuff like that. But all of these computers are built on primarily an open hardware, so anybody can know how they're built and make them up if they want, build them themselves. And all of the software is done with open source software, which again is a crowdsourced thing. Is the software is there, sitting there, and if you find an improvement to the software, anyone with any that feels comfortable with it can go and improve the software. One advantage is, of course, a child that gets interested in software writing can change the software of the computer. They can write their programs and make the computers do something else. And they're loaded with educational activities. So this is not a hardware project. This is an educational project. And what's important is the software that's installed in the, in the computers. It, each child is given a computer, and they are meant to own it unless there are issues with ownership, like in some Pacific communities, there's more community ownership, not private ownership, and so that's respected. Uh, but each child has their computer. They sit at the center of the computer. You can see the little boy there in the center. All of the activities are around them. These little antenna allow the co computers to communicate with each other, so I could be writing a story with you, right, simultaneously. Um, so they're meant for them to collaborate, to be collaborative environment. And one of the nice things about it is that it removes the ceiling for learning. It's no longer about uh, you as a child, are you in the top 10% or not, but how far can you go with your learning experience? And one of the things that we're seeing with these types of one-to-one -one deployments is that it really sorts out the issue of having to teach, for example, math in a one-size-fits-all. There's kids that are going to go faster through the exercises, there are kids that are going to go slower. Those that go faster, guess what? They move to the next activity. So in a class, you could have seven different levels of math, each child learning at their own pace. Now, all of these activities are created so that people can contribute and can modify them based on what they feel is important. The children can modify them based on what they feel is important. Communities can build this based on what they feel is important. And it gives them the power to create their own future based on what they believe that it's important. Um, I know I had something else to say. So I, 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 I grab a computer and play with it. Let's fire those around the room a bit. Yeah. So explore. Oh, by the way, where's Nevin? Oh, there. So he's one of the OLPC hackers. So, so, so bug him. Thank you. Thank you.